So, um, yeah, as uh, you heard, I've been working on irrigation and nutrient management uh, for, for a lot of years in the Salinas Valley and on the Central Coast. And uh, we grow, of course, all these different specialty crops, a lot of vegetables, berries. And uh, we find, you know, nutrient management and water management is quite challenging for the growers um, for several reasons. Number one, it, the growers are generally growing a lot of different commodities and just keeping track of them all is challenging. So you have lots of little fields to manage. Labor is really expensive, never have enough labor. Uh, they're very high value crops and uh, vegetables and berries, they don't suffer by over irrigating them or over fertilizing them. Uh, they do just fine, but the environment doesn't. And, and you'll find this along the central coast and, and other parts on the coast where we have very intensive vegetable and berry production is that the groundwater which we all rely on for our drinking water um, is generally high in nitrate. And uh, this is just showing you the Salinas Valley that the nitrate values in the wells have been, if anything, increasing with time. Um, and the drinking water standard is 10 parts per million nitrate N. And uh, many wells are up there at 30, 40. We've seen wells at 70 parts per million. So some pretty high numbers and for rural communities that means they don't have a drinking water supply and they have to bring in water it's a big cost uh, to do that well the growers can't continue doing this and uh, the regional water quality control board in region 3 which um, has the jurisdiction for the central coast has come up with these uh, regulations where growers are now going to have to report in, uh, about how much nitrogen they're applying to um, a physical acre every year. And it's not just in terms of fertilizer, they have this fancy way of calculating it. It's the applied fertilizer, A, FERT, and then um, how much nitrogen would go on uh, through compost or organic uh, fertilizers, and then through the irrigation water too. So they sum all that up and then they subtract off for what's actually removed from the field in harvested product. So they call it the A minus R calculation. And this year the growers are going to have to report uh, what that um, number is. And so it's essentially um, a way of estimating the loading of nitrogen to our aquifers. And you see there's targets, and we start off at 500 uh, pounds of N per acre per year in, um, this year, and then it starts to ratchet down. For double cropped vegetables, um, this target's going to be pretty challenging in 2027. So for two vegetable crops, you can't have any more than 300 pounds of N applied per acre. And then, you see in 2031, it goes down to 200. So strawberries could probably, you know, handle the 300, but when we get down to 200, it's gonna be getting more challenging. So what growers are going to have to do is look at all the sources of nitrogen that's actually um, uh, utilized by their crops. And you have uh, residual mineral nitrogen in the soil uh, from nitrate and uh, ammonium. You have nitrogen, as I mentioned, in the irrigation water, and then mineralization that's going to happen uh, when you incorporate uh, crop residues, um, amendments uh, in the soil. So you need to account for all of those. The other aspect to it is uh, nitrate, it leaches. Wherever the water goes, uh, it goes. And so it's a negative, right, it's a neg negatively charged molecule and soil as you know is also the clay particles are negatively charged so nitrate doesn't stick onto soil it goes with water it leaches very easily so uh, water management is going to be really critical so if you cut back on nitrogen but you don't uh, take care of the water management and you're still over applying water you're going to find out you're you're losing yields and your crops don't grow well so that's um, 
the other aspect to it, and that's why I work in both water and nutrient management. So what we want growers to do is be very efficient with their irrigation systems and, and operate them at the highest efficiency possible. So we minimize nutrient losses, but also when they're putting fertilizer through their irrigation system, we call it fertigation, that that fertilizer goes out uniformly uh, to the crop. Uh, of course, they can conserve water, and it's also useful for salinity management. And in general, the growers will get better yields and better quality and save money. So that's all the aspects, you know, to having the highest irrigation efficiency possible. So um, what I started realizing over the years is there's really these three sides to a triangle to getting high irrigation efficiency you have to really have uh, address all these sides. If anything is deficient, your irrigation efficiency is less. So you first have to design an irrigation system that applies water very uniformly. And I'll talk about that maybe uh, with strawberries. You have to operate it uh, correctly and maintain it. Right? If you have plugging of drip emitters, it's not gonna be very uniform. And then you have to schedule the water to match the crop needs. So if you do all three of those things, you can be highly efficient with your irrigation. So this is the part where um, I thought I'd make it a little more interactive. I sort of have four parts to this talk. You know, three are to talk about that triangle, you know, system design, maintenance and operation, and scheduling and then also nitrogen management. And I've got a lot of props up here. So, uh, you know, any of these things you're curious about, we can go in different directions here. So we've got bicycle pumps, we've got PVC, you know, all sorts of things. So I don't know if there's one topic here you wanted me to start off with. But, we, but don't take too long to think about it because, uh, you know, we only have 35 minutes. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I couldn't cover all these things, you know, in one talk. Put it up for a vote. How many for system design? Oh, okay. What about a bicycle pump? <laughs> no? But what's that? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So this brings us into uh, maintenance and operation. Okay, so I'm just gonna click on here. And what do you think's going on here? Yeah, underground. So, so this is part two of the talk here. So we've looked at a lot of irrigation systems, particularly strawberry systems, and try to figure out what's going on with them in terms of maintenance and operation. And this is the main issues we find in maintenance. Um, you know, in the drip lines, you find sediment deposited in there, uh, plug emitters, leaks. And then operationally, a lot of drip systems are operated at really low pressures. And when you have uh, low pressures, it doesn't apply the water so uniformly. Um, we see pressure fluctuations in the irrigation block. So, it, you know, part of the irrigation, it's at high pressure, then it's low pressure. Um, we see on hillsides, vacuum developing in the irrigation system, in the drip system, when they turn off the water because the water runs downhill, creates a vacuum. And uh, pressure gauges that are pretty inaccurate on the drip systems. So we always, tell growers, you know, of course, you got to fix your leaks and prevent clogging. And we talked about that today, right, Gerald? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we saw plenty of leaks. And, uh, and in addition, you have to clean, you know, the filters and make sure if they're automatically uh, back flushing, that that works. Uh, sometimes you have to just flush those drip lines if you're injecting fertilizers or anything that's organic uh, type of fertilizer. Uh, they're going to have deposits in there, so you have to drop those out. 
and then uh, periodically inject chemicals to clean out the emitters. And so we use uh, bleach, for example, to kill algae that might develop or acids like uh, a little bit of sulfuric acid or vinegar for organic systems. And then what's very important is if we're running a drip system, uh, it runs at a low pressure. So you, if you have um, you know, really low pressure and then really high pressure, that's going to affect how uniform that water goes out. And so what we want to do is check the pressure in the entire system at the water source, uh, up and downstream of any filters or valves. Make sure your pressure regulators, if you have them out there, are working. And um, at the beginning and the end of your submains and your drip lines. So you want to check the pressure in all these different places. And that brings in the pump, right? Uh, because we found that monitoring pressure uh, is more complicated than it seems. And these are the mechanical pressure gauges we see out there in the field. And a lot of them um, are inaccurate, uh, they're in the wrong place, or they're broken. And then if you buy a, just a brand new mechanical gauge like this, uh, it may be off by one or two PSI, and if you're running irrigation systems at 10 PSI, you know, it could be off by 20%. Uh, so this is what we recommend, is you want to um, sort of follow this protocol. So you see, you, you all know bicycles, right? And you use uh, Schrader valves on your tubes. Well, you can buy these Schrader valves and wherever you would have a pressure gauge, you install a Schrader valve. Uh, so it could be in all those different locations I was talking about. And then on your pressure gauge, you add a Schrader adapter. Okay. And then you're always using the same gauge to check um, the pressure. So you're comparing essentially apples and apples. If you have three or four different pressure gauges out there, they're all going to be at slightly different um, readings, even if they're reading at the same pressure. And then, um, you know, something else we tell the growers is, you know, you don't want to use a pressure gauge that is accurate to 30 PSI or has a range of 30 PSI at high pressures or you'll break them. So these pressure gauges actually just have little gears in here. And if you put it on a really high pressure and it only goes up to 30, uh, it will get off in its calibration. And then finally, you want to calibrate it. And so how do you calibrate it? Well, it, you can use uh, a bicycle pump. And so what we've done here is took PVC. Uh, we just glue end caps. And then I bought online a very accurate uh, electronic pressure gauge. Right? So who volunteered here? You. you you um, so selected this one, so we need you to help uh, here. So I don't know, it's reading zero, right? Yeah. yeah, so what we'll do is put this on here, just like a regular bicycle pump, right? And uh, let's see if this pressure gauge reads the same as this electronic one. So I need you, uh, you can come to this side and just um, pump it up. Yep. And what's it reading there? On the electronic one, do you see? Uh, hold on again. Keep pumping. Okay, what does it read? It reads 20.6, 20 20.3, 20 20.1. And what does this read? Uh, just under. Under 20, huh? Under 20. So this one's off. Yeah. So that's important to note. Let's try a different one. So this is just a simple way, you know, that we can make uh, growers a little more accurate in monitoring pressure. What do you got there? Uh, 
21, and it's at 22. Oh, so this one's much more accurate. And so then we just note uh, with, a sh with a Sharpie, uh, you know, how far it's off. So we're always calibrating it to one pressure gauge. And so the idea is in a farming operation that everyone uses a pressure gauge that's calibrated to the same one and takes care of the pressure gauge. <laughs> yes? But if it's, if it's say, off by 2 at 20, will it be more or less be off by 3 at 30? Or do you have to see how much it's off at different pressures? That's a good question. I don't know. I, mean, I think what we would do is check the calibration at the pressure we would normally use it, which is going to be in around the 10 to 15 range. And so we would want that same pressure throughout your irrigation system typically? Yeah. You're trying to get everything. I mean, the system will not be uniformly 10. In some places it will be 2, some places it will be 12. But if you calibrate it around 10 or 15, it's going to be about this off by 2 everywhere in that range. Yeah. Good. OK, so now we've used this. Let's see. And then I think. There's a little thing I can let the air out. Yes. Um, can you fix the pressure gauges after like readjust them to match the electronic one, or do you just know that it's? Yeah, these unfortunately you can't. Yeah, I've opened them up. It's you know, they're only thirty dollars. So once they're way off, I just open them up to show people. And there's just these little gears in there, like a old watch. Yeah, and so um, there's no sort of putting it back together once you take them off, at least the ones I have. These um, electronic ones are really nice uh, because um, they don't seem to get off and they can be zeroed. So they work well, but they don't do very well getting wet. And that's why we use the mechanical pressure gauges. about a hundred to hundred fifty dollars the other ones are thirty yeah so we we make these for the growers uh, for their irrigators just to show them and introduce them to them and uh, you know it's it's a very simple tool but it really helps them you know do a lot better job in managing pressure and one of the ways we demonstrate it is We'll have a small drip system operating, and we get all the irrigators together. We ask them, what do you think the pressure is? And they all get out there, and they, they uh, squeeze the tape. And one will say 5 PSI, one's 7, one's 6, one's 10. And we say, OK, each of you work on this ranch, but each of you perceive the pressure differently. And each of you are adjusting the pressure differently. So if you're not measuring it, um, even if you know, one of the guys is really accurate, the other people won't be. So that's, it's a lot of convincing, right, to, to try to use these tools. And this is sort of how we scatter these, you know, these Schrader valves around the ranch on the drip system. And this is the example of what we just showed you. So uh, also, another problem in a lot of these uh, irrigation systems is the irrigators are regulating the pressure with a valve. Uh, so what happens is something like this. So this is flow rate over the irrigation during the day. And you can see it starts um, you know, over 700 gallons a minute, but then it dips down. It goes up, down, up. So that's a problem. And that's because they're opening blocks, you know, other irrigation blocks and shutting other irrigation blocks. And that's bad enough, but irrigation to irrigation, so this is the average application rate of the system in terms of inches per hour that it puts out. So if you spread that water in depth over the block, how many inches each hour it puts out, it's varying a lot. Uh, and you know, in this example, it's 33% variation. 
And I always tell the growers, you know, you can't do irrigation scheduling if you don't know how much water you're putting out per hour because they're not, you know, looking at a flow meter. They're just doing everything by time. Uh, operate it two hours or three hours. So you end up with this type of system. So what we're trying to encourage, you know, growers is to use pressure regulating valves um, that will automatically regulate the pressure. And in, I would say 95% of the strawberry growers do not use them right now. They're relying on their irrigators to, to set the pressure. Uh, they, the best we've, we, progress we've made is using these. A number of them use this. And, um, but the, if you install these at each of your sub-main main connections, um, it will automatically adjust the pressure and keep it at the, your set pressure. You just need uh, you know, sufficient upstream pressure for these to work because they always are reducing the pressure and you have to train your, the staff there. And there's some new types of uh, pressure reducing valves that are easier to use. There's these non-adjustable ones. They're set at 10 PSI, nothing to do. Uh, they work for a, a, a sh small range of flow rates. And then there's these new adjustable ones um, that are very easy to use that we've been demonstrating. So uh, that's all on maintenance and operation. Yes. Yeah, it's not. Do you know why? Uh, well, a number of different reasons. One, it costs money. Yeah. Uh, number two, the, um, the staff often don't know how to use them. And number three, um, if they get damaged or anything, they can cause problems. They won't regulate, right? So it just takes one bad experience for an irrigator and they're like, I'm taking this off the system. Because I've known a number of growers invested in them and then their staff uh, took them out. And so it's, it's a combination of reasons. Yes? So would you say like, to avoid those issues, you do regular maintenance, but how often is that regular maintenance and how often would you have to replace those? Because I assume the valves would eventually wear down. Well, the, uh, the pressure regulating valves um, unless you br break some of the tubes that are on there, they, they work just fine. You just have to check them once in a while. They do have some filters inside them that sometimes get clogged up, um, but uh, we don't have many problems with most of them, especially those new ones I've showed you. They're very reliable. Um, and a lot of the other problems is the, the, uh, the growers buy you know, what's cheapest, but they don't realize these, these pressure regulating valves have to be sized for your flow rate and the pressures you want. And so they'll change, say, the drip tape to something maybe it puts out more water per hour. And now the regulator won't work right because it's beyond its capacity. So these regulators are made for a certain range of flow rates. Uh, and so a lot of the irrigators just think of things as, uh, okay, I have a three inch uh, sub main, I need a three inch uh, valve and I need a three inch pressure regulating valve. And it doesn't work that way. It just really depends on um, you know, what pressures you want and what flows you're going to have through the system. So, all right, so uh, any other topics? We did one. Scheduling. What's that? Scheduling. Scheduling. Okay. All right. So, um, so I wanted to talk about, you know, there's various approaches to irrigation scheduling and uh, we there's one, one method is called weather-based. We use evapotranspiration uh, for scheduling. Plant-based, we ask the plant water status, or we look at the plant water status to make decisions on irrigating and, and soil-based, you're monitoring soil moisture. And 
what works best usually in um, berries is using soil moisture in terms of maybe when to irrigate and sort of give you feedback if you're irrigating correctly. But in terms of the amount of water the crop needs, uh, we find weather-based works very nicely. I mean, you can monitor the soil moisture and say, yeah, it's dry or it's wet, but then how much water do you need to apply? That's always the question. And so using evapotranspiration data, we can calculate how much a crop needs. And I want to mention, if you're going to do irrigation scheduling, use flow meters uh, because they can help with a lot of different things beside, beyond um, just scheduling. Uh, first, they tell you how much water you applied. You might do everything by time, but we just talked about how pressure can vary, and so you put out different amounts of water each time. But if you have a flow meter, uh, you can see exactly how much you put out. And What's great is, you know, when I started my job as a farm advisor, there was two broken flow meters in the back of our office. And they said, this is what you're gonna use as a farm advisor for teaching growers how to irrigate. It's like, this is not gonna work. Um, so I start buying flow meters because if you can't measure what they're doing, how, you, how would I give them advice? And uh, the flow meters turned out just like the pressure gauges, not to be so accurate when I first started my career. But there's these new types of flow meters that are uh, magnetic. Uh, they're very accurate. They don't come out of calibration, so they're really good. And uh, the flow meter will also tell you what your application rate is. You see in gallons per minute, right, um, over a certain time, then you can calculate how many inches per hour you're putting out. And also the flow rate can tell you if there's any problems with the drip system. So if you have plugging of the emitters, you're, you'll see your flows go down over time. If you have leaks, the flow goes up. So when I turn on my irrigation system, I really look at what's my flow rate, make sure it's consistent each time. Um, so with weather-based uh, scheduling, what we're doing is getting reference evapotranspiration, and we have this network of weather stations operated by the Department of Water Resources called CIMIS, uh, that, which means California Irrigation Management and Information System. And you multiply it by a crop coefficient uh, to figure out for your crop what is the water use of that crop. And um, one of the issues I found was that strawberry growers, vegetable growers, they were not making much use of this. And one of the reasons was they said, well, I don't really know what the crop coefficient is for my crop. What we found, you know, over the years was we could relate it to the canopy cover because the more uh, foliage you have out there, the more it intercepts light, yeah, right? And the more light you intercept, the more water the crop uses because it's intercepting uh, more radiation, more energy. And so, unfortunately, I had to send my uh, staff out with these cameras on a tall pole, take a lot of pictures of a lot of uh, strawberry fields, uh, raspberry fields, vegetable fields. And what we were able to do is develop these models of how what we call fractional cover uh, changes over the season and uh, make use of that. So then we developed uh, an online platform, uh, Crop Manage, which um, will do all the calculations for growers because we know they're not gonna take that curve and do all the math on it. So we wanted to make something really simple uh, that they can use where they just put in the date once they set up their, their ranch and their, their plantings on there they just put in a date and they can get the irrigation recommendation based on the closest simis station to their uh, ranch. And so this is sort of how it would look. You uh, enter a date, what ir your irrigation method is, and you get a recommendation. And then we can reveal to them the recommendation summary. So right there. And uh, you see average ET, for the last um, two days was 0.13 inches per day. It has a crop coefficient. We 
factor in the uniformity of the irrigation system and you can put in a leaching fraction and it will subtract off of precipitation. So we reveal you know, exactly how it makes the calculation. We even show the equation if they want to see it. Now, we've done trials to make sure these crop coefficients and the ET scheduling works. And uh, this is um, just some plots that we did with Driscoll's a number of years ago. But can you pick out, because um, what we did was we, we applied 50%, 75, 100, and 150% of the crop managed recommendation, which is based on AT. Can you pick out the 150% treatment there? Or the 50% treatment? You know, it all looks pretty good, right? Yeah. So this is what's interesting about strawberries is they don't really show you the water stress. And um, there's the 50% crop ET is right next to the 150. And you can see the 150 looks a little bit bigger in terms of the canopy uh, or in the plants. And it's a little bit lighter color. Maybe you can see that. But well, you wouldn't know as a grower that you were under irrigating or over irrigating, just looking at the crop. And a lot of growers tell me, well, I just look at the crop and I can tell if I'm over irrigating or under irrigating. It's like, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, and this is the yield we got. So the different treatments. And so the 100%, we pretty much maxed out the yield. And this is terms of marketable <coughs> fruit um, in terms of, so it's about 90,000 uh, pounds over the season per acre. I have a question yeah. Um, good questions. So let's see. The, if a grower has their own weather station, they can take that data and there's a place to manually put it in. But we haven't developed it like you can take any commercial um, weather station and get the data in automatically. But you can edit the ET data. And then uh, it's not proprietary. It was developed by the university. Uh, you know, and I you know, participate in this development. And so it's totally free for growers to use um, commercial companies. If they want to make use of the algorithms, we have uh, an API, an application protocol interface, so they can take all the algorithms and use it in their software if they would like to do that. And I would say a lot of the commercial companies that do develop irrigation scheduling uh, products they're always trying to sell the growers something physical, like a uh, soil moisture sensor, or maybe, you know, Thule systems, which has um, a way to directly measure ET in your field. There's always some widget they're selling. And uh, with crop manage, you don't need any equipment, although you can interface equipment with it. Um, but, um, you know, it's, so you don't see that m many services where it's just Here's some software, and this is how, you know, use it, and you, you pay a certain amount per month. Uh, so that seems to be the business plans of a lot of these companies. They, they sell sensors. You could put it in the field, like soil moisture sensors, flow meters, weather stations. Uh, but they're not, the software seems to come free with those uh, pieces of equipment. So there is some type of software, but it's mostly for uh, looking at the uh, equipment or the sensors out in the field, putting it on graphs and it's all in the cloud and it's great. But I, you know, I've talked to growers and they're like, this is nice, but it still doesn't tell me how long to irrigate. And so the innovation, I think what we've, our approach is we tell the grower exactly how long to irrigate. Uh, so yeah, and then we, we test our algorithms and sometimes they're not right and we adjust them. Uh, 
So this is just shows you the seasonally how much water we applied, you know, for those different treatments. And then, yeah, soil moisture sensors. Uh, so y there's two different ways you can monitor soil moisture, tension-based. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, that's a good treat, uh, good question. Um, so we did a different trial um, at the same ground and they had macrofemina there. And what we found was um, we had to go to 130% of ET to maximize yield. The 100% gave a little less yield. And that's it just because the root system isn't as efficient under that disease. So that, that was a different trial like two years later and uh, so that really changes things. Yeah, and then in terms of soil moisture sensing, uh, yeah, I was mentioning tension-based versus volumetric-based. And um, volumetric is you know, how many inches per foot of soil or how much volume of the soil is occupied by water. And then tension-based is how hard is it for that plant to pull that water out of the soil pores? The problem with volumetric measurements is a sandy soil, right? It, does it hold more or less water than a clay soil? You say, you all took soil science, right? Less water. less water, right? So how do you compare the numbers, you know, from field to field? With tension, um, you know, which is um, really about the vacuum that it takes to pull the water out of the pores, that's exactly what you know, roots are seeing. So it, whether it's a clay soil or a sandy soil, um, you, you require the same amount of energy. And so we've worked with tensiometers and um, this is another thing was we started looking at the aerometer tensiometer which is very much used throughout uh, United States and actually the world and they're based out of um, Southern California but we found they weren't that reliable and a lot of growers were telling us yeah I try those and they always lose vacuum so I don't know are most of you familiar with how tensiometers work who is not <laughs> All right. happen to bring one <laughs> so uh, we fill it with water, and this is a ceramic cup here. And the ceramic cup lets water through, right? Uh, but not air through, unless you get to a very high vacuum. And uh, this goes to zero to 100 uh, kilopascals of vacuum. And so what happens is if the soil is drier, the water goes out of this and then you develop vacuum and it comes to equilibrium with the soil's dryness. Think of the soil as a sponge and it has capillaries and it just pulls the water out. And when, the, when you irrigate, uh, water goes back in and, uh, and you lose vacuum again. And that's exactly you know, how a root's pulling water you know, out of the soil. So you can really uh, assess the soil water status. And so we've developed uh, a simpler version so you don't have to buy the aerometer ones. Uh, working with a company in Santa Barbara, they make the ceramic cup part and they added on this piece, uh, which is made of PVC, so we can just glue it to PVC. And then we found uh, pretty reliable pressure gauges that are less than $20, uh, so we could put those on. So, um, and then we use this stopper here. So it's very simple. Uh, you know, I was um, thinking, why am I dealing with these uh, commercial uh, tensiometers? Because when I was at Cornell, we were always making our own tensiometers. And so uh, we, we put this on a blog on how to make them. We call them the 10 minute tensiometer because it takes less than 10 minutes to make. And it's been a very popular blog article. A lot of growers are, have uh, gone to it. And then if we want to, we can add on um, a little T in a pressure transducer and this can go on a data logger. We can record it. Uh, 
we can put it on that crop managed software that I showed you. So that's uh, been a very handy tool. Question yes. You fill it up. Yeah, and here's an example. Uh, can I use this? I don't know if maybe you can come up again or another volunteer. But you see it's at a high tension. I, I can pass this around maybe and you look. And this one's at a high tension. But if I, I just want someone to take a look at this. But if I put a wet paper towel on this, you'll see this needle start to drop, I think. Is it dropping yet? Yeah, because the water is going in, and so it's losing vacuum. And conversely, if I have a dry paper towel and put it around it, you'll see it go up. So it, it requires, you know, no batteries, it works. Um, and what do you pay for one that you buy off the internet? Or yeah, they're over a hundred dollars, you know, or two hundred dollars or something. And this, we make it for about fifty-five dollars parts, but we don't count our labor. Uh, so, anyway, um, if you're interested in learning about it, um, the ten-minute tensiometer, I put a QR code there to take you to that blog article. Uh, so, there. Okay, so we only got a little bit done, huh? And it's already five. So is this the stop time? Uh, we can let's let's stop here. Yeah. And and, and maybe if there are questions that involve other things, we can dive into that. Let's thank. Uh, yeah. Any questions that you had while he was presenting or on other aspects of, did you have a question? Um, you mentioned <coughs> nitrogen or nitrate leaching being a big problem. I thought like with strawberries, if you're going into a field that has like a decent level of organic matter, you be getting for the first time, <coughs> wouldn't a lot of the nitrogen like um, in the organic matter be like mineralizing when like and kill all those microbes and then you have like a time and a lot of times in send your souls and then you have like a buffer period where nothing's being planted or taking up water so do you think that uh, mineralization factor could, could contribute to more nitrate leaching with strawberries? Um, yeah I, I guess uh, if you're you have mineralization happening um, and the strawberry plants aren't taking anything up at that point that's definitely uh, leachable nitrate but um, you know as you plant the strawberries if you don't put any pre-plant fertilizer on that will help you know reduce some of the leaching that would happen and a lot of growers have cut back on what we call pre-plant nitrogen and um, but the problem is at least up in the Watsonville area is we plant in end of uh, October, November, and then the rains come. So any nitrogen that mineralized or any fertilizer you put out there uh, will tend to start to leach. And there's not much uptake at that point. We don't get uptake really significantly for 100 days after planting. Maybe we get 10 or 15 pounds of N per acre into the crop by February or March. And then it starts taking up a lot of nitrogen. So it's, it's tricky because um, a lot of growers will measure their soil in and they find out it's low in January or February and then they want to put fertilizer on, right? But the plant's not taking much up. Yeah. So can you prevent a good amount of leaching by just educating a farmer on when is the right time to apply it in the process? You can try. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> they said it's a very valuable crop, right? And they want to, they want early production. And uh, if they feel the plants are lagging, they'll put on the nitrogen. 
But one of the tools I didn't have a chance to show you is, are you familiar with the soil nitrate quick test? Yeah, so you can use this and, uh, and test the soil. And also we tell them, you can use this test to test your irrigation water too, the same strip. And you can see how much nitrogen is your water, how much is in the soil. You could probably avoid uh, putting fertilizer on. That's why they are having these regulations because yeah, we tell the growers what they should be doing, but they don't implement things necessarily. And it's, it's because it's hard to implement on a field by field basis. It's better to have a, you know, your recipe you use on all your, your blocks than having to adjust things based on every field's need. The nitrogen quick test, could you just briefly describe how to do it? Yeah, it, uh, so, so how it's a, uh, right, right. So I brought, I brought one. It's a weak solution of calcium chloride, 0.01 molar, and it's 30 milliliters here. And then you fill it, you go through the field, you take soil samples in a bunch of places, composite together in a bucket, and maybe sieve it so it's pretty uniform. And I happen to bring some soil here. And then you put in enough soil to raise the water level to 40 mils. So uh, 10 milliliters of material. So like this. Don't put the piece of wood in there like I did. Something like this, except all the way up to the top. You would shake it for about a minute. And then you let it settle. And then here is one I already did. And so then we just have the growers take a strip. And you have it develop color for one minute. So I can't really see, but we'll just you can see it develop some pinkness here. And uh, then we compare it to the color chart that's on the bottle here. So I got this out of a, a field. It's already at the 100 here. So this is less than a minute. You can pass this around see the amount of nitrogen that it is developing. So right near our office, we had a lettuce field and they just incorporated it. Can you read on there what, what color you have? So there's a top, a hundred, and it's about 23 parts per million nitrate in, in the soil. So if you were coming with the next crop, you already have enough nitrogen, you don't need any fertilizer. There's already enough residual in in that soil. And that only took me, you know, 15 minutes, you know, to collect that soil and, and evaluate it. And this growers are using, they're using a lot of that. That's a great thing to, and this is very inexpensive, right? Are they, how, how much for a bottle of? Well, you, the strips are about two bucks each. Two bucks each. Yeah. A little more than I thought, but All right. still yeah. very cheap. Yeah. What other questions? I was wondering, is there like a app, like an app for nitrogen management where you can say like I put on this fertilizer, I irrigate yeah. this, and this is the parts per million? Glad you I asked. Think. Glad you asked. Because <laughs> that same app, the crop manage, it's for nitrogen too. So I have example here. So here here it is, and uh, I have a strawberry field. So. You got that number there, and um, we can put that soil test right in here. So you got, uh, we do it for today. Soil type, that's the quick test. We don't need depth, was uh, one foot. And then we'll say 100. That was your reading, right? So we create that, and now it's recorded. Um, that was on the strip, so this is what it would be in the soil. 
So about 60 parts per million. That is a lot of nitrogen. Because what, you know, that 23 was in the solution, but then when you do all the calculations, it's 60 parts per million in the soil. And, um, and then we can do, say we want to fertilize, we can add on a fertilization event for tomorrow. We choose a fertilizer type. Uh, let's first do it. This is for strawberries. We say we fertilize every twice per month. We'll calculate it without the soil sample. And it says, oh, put on about five gallons with, with your next um, fertilization. And again, we, we can tell you why, you know, we have a recommendation. This is how much the crop will take up in, you know, two weeks. Uh, this is the mineralization. There's all the calculations, but then we can add in the soil sample effect. So we put that in, and now the recommendation's uh, much less. Now you say, why isn't it zero? Well, what we do is, for this model for strawberries, if it's really high, we still put some on, but we put it, put it much less. Something this high, probably you don't need anything, right? Um, also, we have a way we can include nitrogen from the water in addition. So um, if we say we're using this well one, 100%, it uh, will automatically calculate how, what the nitrogen contribution would be. And it says six, you'd get six gallons of fertilizer equivalents just from your water. So if you cal calculate for the end in your soil and in your water and update this recommendation, you can see you don't need any fertilizer. So that, yeah, so that's a long way uh, of answering your question. But w yeah, we've already taken care of developing an app and trying to make it work better. Yeah. When you're conducting your soil samples for NCAS, do you do multiple like randomized plots throughout the field? Because if you take one sample, say at the beginning of the field, you might have one each at the end. Yeah, I see you. Uh, yeah, you'd go in a lot of different places in the field. You mix it all together yeah. in one succinct test? Yeah, in one. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You know how regulators plan to measure excess nitrogen on a farm basis? Yeah, that's the A minus R calculation. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to measure it directly. They're going to have growers self-report. There. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you might ask, well, wouldn't they lie? <laughs> <laughs> well, they can be audited. And they'll look at, well, how much fertilizer did you buy last year? And it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out if they're over applying. I have a question about the, the, the pressure gauges. So if, if they're off, do you throw it away? Or do you, let's say you, you want to measure 10. Yeah. But this is this is giving you a reading of 15 when it should be 10. This it's is a $30 item. I would return it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but you don't you don't subtract or add 5 to everything and call it accurate. If if it's off by like 1 or 2, we put it on the back, we on a Sharpie, we say plus, plus two. 2, add 2 or okay. subtract 2, whatever you want to do that's consistent. So that every mechanical gauge is getting you to the same pressure. Yeah. How many of these, when you buy them, are off to the point that you would want to return them? Very few. I okay. mean, most of them are plus or minus two. But two is 20%, right? Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. But you'll keep that one. Yeah. But and only a very relatively few of them will be that far off that yeah. you have to return. And the nice thing is, you know, you. You're using the same pressure gauge. If you're the one evaluating the field, you're going to different places in that block. So it's all relative. And you know, OK, it's 3 PSI at the bottom of the field. It's 7 at the top. 
so there's a, you know, a four PSI difference. So you can at least get the differential correct. And then if you have a written, you know, add two, you, you just add two to everything. Yeah. All right, any other questions for Dr. Cohen? Well, uh, thank you again, Michael, yeah. for coming and speaking. To us.